There are a lot of ways that we can try to make money in the stock market. One way is to simply invest in an index fund and achieve the market average returns. Another way is to buy dirt cheap businesses with questionable economics for the long term that might be really cheap on a quantitative basis. You can even try to glean some information from technical analysis of stock charts with the prices moving up and down. But there is another way to approach investing, and this is the system that Warren Buffett has actually popularized, and it is basically buying wonderful companies at reasonable prices and letting that company compound its value for a very long time. In Pat Dorsey's book, The Little Book That Builds Wealth, he lays out some ground rules for how to actually do this long-term compounding approach. Step one is identify businesses that can generate above average profits for many years. Step two, wait until the shares of those businesses trade for less than their intrinsic value and then buy. Number three, hold those shares until either the business deteriorates, the shares become overvalued, or you find a better investment. This holding period should be measured in years, not months. Step four, repeat as necessary. Many of the investors that I truly admire have made this transition from buying stocks that are cheap quantitatively to a long-term approach where they want to buy wonderful businesses. Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett have obviously been preaching this practice for decades at this point. Nick Sleep also enlightened Monish Pabrai to come around to this point of view as well for his investing approach. And Pat Dorsey is another investor recently that I have discovered that also follows this practice. In this book, Dorsey introduces a pretty nice framework for trying to find these long-term compounders that we'll hopefully be holding onto for a very long time. In the first couple chapters, Dorsey lays out his framework for the concept of economic moats. In this video, I wanna discuss economic moats through the lens of Pat Dorsey's framework, and then we can invert that and discuss what an economic moat isn't according to the framework. Now, this is probably as important as understanding how to identify a moat. So I'm very thankful that Dorsey has written a whole chapter based on it. This will be the first video in a series of videos covering Dorsey's framework in the book, The Little Book That Builds Wealth. I would highly recommend reading this book if you're interested in economic moats. And there will be a link to this video in the video description below if you wanna check that out. Let me know in the comments if you've read this book and what your take is on economic moats. Do you think Dorsey's framework is generally correct or do you have some disagreements with it? The concept of economic moats is also described really thoughtfully in the book, Competition Demystified by Professor Bruce Greenwald. And I would also highly recommend that you check out that book as well. These two books go hand in hand and are great companions for each other's for understanding economic moats. Okay, let's take a look at economic moats through the lens of Pat Dorsey's framework and what that can teach us about companies that can continually achieve high returns on their invested capital. Let's start off with defining economic moats within Pat Dorsey's framework. A moat is a term I think popularized by Warren Buffett where he describes a castle surrounded by a moat of water. And in this metaphor, the castle is actually the business and the moat is some entrenched characteristics about that business that help stave off any competitors. Basically, a moat is a fancy way of describing a business's competitive advantage. Dorsey believes that companies with moats are much more valuable than companies without moats. If we compare two companies, company A has a moat and company B has no moat, and both companies are reinvesting their earned capital back into the business at high rates of return, the company with a moat because it's able to fend off competitors, is gonna to continue to be able to reinvest at a high rate of return. Company B, on the other hand, will likely see much of their investments earn a very low rate of return as soon as competitors come in and try to eat away at the business opportunity. Company A is much more likely to produce a higher economic value over the long term than company B for this simple reason. So if we subscribe to the idea that a company's true intrinsic value is a matter of all of the cash that the company will produce over its economic lifetime, then it's pretty easy to see why company A with a moat will be a lot more valuable than company B because it'll produce cash flows for a much longer time frame. So here we can see company A and company B compared, where company A is able to provide much more economic return over the long period compared to company B, where you can quickly see that as competition enters the picture, we're seeing a lot less return on their invested capital. One great thing about moats is that while no moat is permanent, 
simply because no business is going to last forever. It does provide a lot of downside protection where a company with a moat, even if it is being slowly eroded away, is much more likely to protect your capital compared to a business that might go out of business overnight. Dorsey claims that investing in companies with economic moats can really enhance our investment process. For one, it prevents us from paying too high a price for a company that clearly doesn't have a very durable competitive advantage compared to its competitors. Also, it narrows the investable universe of companies that we're willing to look at to companies with wonderful competitive advantages. So it keeps us focused on businesses that will last for a long time. So if this is something that we want to incorporate into our investing approach, then we can think about moats as one more filter to run quickly companies through and either discard or try to figure out more about what their competitive advantage is. With this approach, you only look at wonderful businesses and discard the rest. It makes the job a little bit easier. In the first chapter, Dorsey gives the example of Coca-Cola as a company with a clear moat in their business. Dorsey talks about the disastrous launches of products like New Coke that for a business without a durable competitive advantage would have completely destroyed them. However, Coke always had its original formula and its, and its wonderful brand to fall back on. So that was a little bit about what an economic moat is. And I wanna discuss the four core aspects of Dorsey's framework that are the key attributes for defining an economic moat. The first one is intangible assets. And this can be a wonderful brand like Coca-Cola. It can be patents or regulatory licenses that don't allow other competitors into the space. The next attribute is the concept of switching costs, where one product is so deeply integrated into a customer's daily life that it's really difficult to give it up. This creates a lot of pricing power and mind share for each customer. I would think about the iPhones from Apple, for instance. This next point goes hand in hand with the switching cost concept, which is the network effect. This is a type of economic moat that as a network grows, it becomes more and more useful for each member of that network. Twitter becomes much more useful to me as there are more users on the platform, and that makes me less likely to leave the platform. The last attribute of an economic moat is the concept of cost advantages, and that can either come from scale or location or a specific process that allows this company to become the lowest cost competitor. Dorsey runs his own fund now, but he was an integral part of Morningstar's effort to create their Morningstar rating, which provides a moat rating for each business to help determine their competitive advantage. So these are the four key points that actually make up the Morningstar rating. So when they ascribe a moat value to a company, these are the four categories that they're looking at. So if we can find a company that has at least one of these four characteristics, then we're certainly well on our way to identifying a company with a wonderful moat. All right, now that we've talked a little bit about economic moats and identified the four key characteristics of a company with economic moats, let's talk a little bit about what a moat is not. Again, Dorsey gives four characteristics that we can look for in companies that do not equal an economic moat. These characteristics naturally will help the business, but they do not necessarily define a company with an economic moat. These tricky attributes are a great product, a big size, excellent execution, and wonderful management. Regarding a great product, Dorsey gives the example of Krispy Kreme donuts, and that makes me hungry just thinking about it. But of course, Krispy Kremes, if you've ever had them, they're a delicious product, but they by no means have a competitive advantage over others. It's a wonderful product and it tastes delicious, but there's nothing stopping me from going to the grocery store and buying a different type of donut compared to a Krispy Kreme. There's no switching cost. There's a little bit of brand recognition, but again, that isn't stopping me from buying another donut that could taste equally as good as a Krispy Kreme. And there's no patent on donut making that can prevent others from entering the space. And I can't really identify any network effects or competitive advantages with cost production. Also, size isn't an indicator that a company has an economic moat. Do you remember Kodak or IBM or Xerox? How about Netscape, one of the first internet browsers? All of these products, even though they had very large size, did not stick around. 
because you have to continually build your moat and defend it from competitors. And all of these businesses ceded a lot of market share to other competitors. So just because you are big in size does not necessarily mean that the company has a durable competitive advantage. Dorsey says it's not important whether or not a company has high market share, but it matters how the company got that high market share. Size can help a company maintain and grow its competitive advantage, but it is certainly not an indicator that a company already has a competitive advantage. Next, operational efficiency. I'm sorry, but that is not an indicator of an economic moat. It is excellent for your business, but any business that has a model of being more efficient than others is naturally going to run into competitors that are gonna be able to be as efficient, if not more than them. The only way that this could potentially be a competitive advantage is if this company is using a process that legally others cannot copy. Finally, we come to the idea of wonderful management teams. Now, I would much rather invest in a company with a wonderful management team than not, However, it again is not an indicator of a moat. There's an old pithy quote by Warren Buffett where he says that he would love to invest in companies that can be run by people who are not very intelligent. Despite the incompetence of the management, the business will survive. If you have a wonderful business run by mediocre management team, the reputation of the business will remain intact. But if you have a terrible business run by a wonderful management team, then again, the reputation of the business will remain intact. So. According to Dorsey and Buffett, the management really doesn't have much of an impact on whether or not the company has a moat. And anyway, it's really hard to actually identify when a manager is actually making a huge impact at a company. It's usually an after the fact sort of investigation compared to a forward looking idea. So seeing a specific management team is not necessarily going to tell you how the business is gonna go in the future. All right, let me briefly summarize this discussion of economic moats. Moats are inherent characteristics that protect a business from outside competitors. The four key points when trying to identify these competitive advantages are intangible assets, switching costs, network effects, and cost advantages. And finally, while products, size, execution, and management all help businesses in the long run, they are not indicators of economic moats. Come back to this section in the future if you want a refresher on economic moats. Most of the information in this video comes from the book, The Little Book That Builds Wealth by Pat Dorsey. Again, I would highly recommend this book for investigating economic moats. I hope you learned a little bit about what an economic moat is if you weren't familiar with the concept, or I hope it was a good refresher for you if you haven't thought about this concept in a little while. I'll continue to distill the lessons from this book going forward. I will cover the four main characteristics of moats in more depth as I continue through the book. If you enjoyed this video, you may want to check out my video over here where I discuss one of Pat Dorsey's more recent investments in a company called SEMrush. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel if you want to stay up to date with the future content surrounding the information in this book. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate your time and I will see you in the next video.